Welcome everyone, I'm, I'm Luke Bedimer, I'm a reporter at Tortoise and tonight we're asking, is Instagram bad for you? Um, wrapped up in this question are some very serious concerns about body consciousness, um, anxiety, depression, self-harm stemming from, from usage of uh, one of the most popular social media platforms in the world. Um, Instagram, which is of course owned by Meta Platforms, formerly called Facebook, is used by about 2 billion people every month, um, which is of course a, a quarter of the world's population. It's staggeringly popular. Um, and yet last year, the Wall Street Journal um, reported on internal documents and presentations from within Facebook that showed uh, unequivocally that Instagram was having a negative effect on the mental health of its users, particularly that of, of young women. Um, it's important for me to, to take a moment now to note that tonight's thinking may well involve discussion of, of self-harm and of suicide, as well as uh, potentially distressing subjects besides. And you're very welcome to drop in and out of, of the thinking if that's how you feel most comfortable. Um, my colleague, James Wilson, is going to put some information in the chat. Um, and if you or someone that you know is considering suicide or experiencing anxiety or depression or would simply like to talk, um, please refer to that information, um, consider contacting your doctor, your local mental health authority, or a crisis helpline to, to speak to someone who can help. Um, so a, a tortoise thinking is an opportunity for us to think about a really challenging subject together um, and to come to a clearer point of view about it. So everyone in the room, the, the virtual room, is invited to, to share their views. And you can do that by raising your digital hand um, or please do post your thoughts and ideas in the chat where, again, uh, James is going to be looking out for your ideas. Um, I'm, I'm very grateful to be joined by a few panellists this evening um, who are going to help us think about this topic. So I want to, to welcome Ian Russell, who is the chair trustee of the Molly Rose Foundation. Um, Dr. Elizabeth Sylvan, who's a managing director of the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at uh, Harvard University, and also to Kyle Dent, who is the head of AI ethics at CheckStep, who are using AI to moderate online harm and, and misleading content. Um, without further ado, I'd like, it would be great to turn to them now. And I thought uh, perhaps we could start with you, Ian. Um, because I think it would be really helpful to get an, an insight into the work of the Molly Rose Foundation um, and also the, the parts of this debate as to whether Instagram is bad for you that, that you think are really important. Yes, um, thank you very much, Luke. Um, I think this is going to be a fascinating uh, discussion. I'm looking forward to hearing what people have to say, particularly the other panellists. Um, my contribution to events this evening is really to talk about what I've learned after the tragic death of my youngest daughter in November of 2017. Molly uh, ended her own life um, completely unexpectedly. Um, we've said um, since her death that she showed no obvious signs of any mental illness or any distress, um, but she must have, towards the end of her short life, she must have been living with um, a, a tremendous anguish and battling, probably battling depression, we may never know. Um, but um, since her death, I've, I've learned quite a bit about mental illness and, and mental well-being, um, and quite a bit about what may have affected Molly, um, because we looked quite quickly after someone dies, you want answers. And uh, we quickly turned to her social media platforms. She didn't seem to be much of a social media animal. She was um, uh, the youngest of three children and uh, the, the one that, that used it, um, social media the, the least, I would, would say. Um, but what we found there when we looked deeper amongst the people that she followed were some really disturbing accounts that I had no um, conception could be allowed to exist on a platform like Instagram. There are accounts that encouraged um, self-harm in the first place. There are accounts that normalized depression, normalized anxiety. Um, there are accounts that perhaps the most dangerous accounts of all were the ones that just um, made Molly feel helpless and isolated 
and lonely. Um, and we know some of this because she did leave us some notes, um, a handful of notes that tried to explain what had happened uh, in her life. Um, but we found material that was really shocking. But then what shocked us um, is when we reported this material, which ranged from graphic self-harm content that was quite bloody, um, quite immediately disturbing to see, to um, more subtle content that may be called um, legal but harmful content, which just drip-fed, depressive, black and white memes quite often. The one that always comes to mind was a, a, a simple cartoon drawing of a young girl that just said, who would love a suicidal girl? And if you're drip fed that sort of content, I know what effect it's had on me uh, looking at the content that Molly saw and saved and liked. And I have to ration the amount of time I, I um, expose myself to that content, as do the police who have um, investigated her case, as do the legal team who are looking into the data um, that, um, that Molly's accounts contained, because Molly's inquest is still ongoing. Um, we hope um, this April that the inquest will, will come to pass. It's been a long, a long wait, but we hope it's worthwhile. We've got a very supportive coroner who's, who's um, helped us in our quest to find out as much as we can about what happened in Molly's life before she ended her life, so that we might learn as much as possible from it and that we might take steps to change um, the online world, all of us. Um, and to to make it a safer place, particularly for young and vulnerable people. Um, and, and there have been some changes. A fortnight after Molly's story broke in the news in early 2019, Adam Masseri, the head of Instagram, um, was flown to the UK, uh, where he announced that there'd be a change of the community guidelines that Instagram had, and that they'd no longer allow graphic self-harm content on there platform, something I wrongly assumed that wouldn't have been allowed in the first place, but that mm -hmm. was a positive change. And there've been other changes since, but I think what four years down the line or more than four years down the line from Molly's death has told me that change is all too slow. And while this is happening in the UK alone, um, official figures show that there are something like four school-aged children who end their own lives every week there are four families like ours, mm. four groups of friends like Molly's friends that have to put up with this and go through this and whose lives will be forever different. And from what I've seen, there's a definite link between um, depressive self-harm, anxiety, eating disorder, suicidal ideation, yeah. and what young people find online. And I think we need to do things as much as we possibly can to make the digital world a safer space. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Ian. I, there's um, so much in, in that narrative that I think is really helpful for us in thinking about maybe what are the constituent parts of this conversation and what all of us can go away and think about more and, and perhaps advocate for. But what, one of the ones I wanted to, to touch on first is this idea of harmful but legal content. Um, and I wondered, Kyle, um, in, in your work at CheckStep, you've been grappling with which pieces of content pass muster and which ones you can identify subtly, as Ian mentioned, as potentially harmful. I, I wondered if you could speak a little bit about sort of what moderation systems do in order to understand that sort of graded um, difference between content and a little bit about check, step, check steps work, um, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, I think um, I could start by talking a little bit about kind of ethical thinking within AI mm. and how much that's been missing among AI researchers and developers. And um, hearing Ian's story is a just staggeringly sad case of how AI has real world effects that are impacting people's lives in lots of ways. In Molly's case, the worst possible way. But it, uh, as Ian was speaking, I was thinking about recommendation systems that were kind of feeding this, this worse content for her. And um, the idea among probably the content moderators that we've got AI that's looking for this 
kind of harmful content, even, you know, the, the legal versus illegal is a different question, but to think that AI, to put too much faith into AI is another classic mistake and an ethical mistake. Um, as far as the legal versus illegal, I, I think we get into questions of freedom of speech there, but platforms get to decide what kind of environment they want for their users. And users can participate or not uh, in the kinds of platforms they're looking for. So content moderation tries to create that appropriate content environment. Mm. Uh, but the idea that AI can do it by itself is just wrongheaded, that um, AI is not capable enough of understanding context adequately to make right. it uh, to make it be a viable solution on its own. Um, so th there was another part, I, I think, that connects to this that you mentioned, Ian, about community guidelines. And I, I went and had a look at some of the changes that um, the Instagram CEO, uh, Adam Moresi, had announced since um, the, the kind of the revelations of the Facebook files, which for many people simply confirmed suspicions about what had been going on within Facebook and the Instagram platform. But some of them, I, I thought it might be interesting to consider their implications and, and ask you, Elizabeth and Carl and Ian, um, did, what, one of the changes is suggesting that people uh, that it enforces a break from usage of Instagram. So every so often a user is shown a, um, a prompt saying you've spent X amount of time scrolling on a feed or engaging with a part of the app and suggests that they, they take a break, uh, take a break. Another, um, which we might take in turn is that um, he announced a sort of unspecified restriction on what the algorithm will recommend to teens. Um, and I wonder if I could actually just put both of those back to you, Kyle. Firstly, the idea of limiting the amount of time as a means for sort of curtailing harm. And then also the problem of Instagram announcing a change to their algorithm that's supposedly better, um, but not disclosing sort of with full transparency uh, what yeah, I think that's really the problem with the social, the big social media platforms is um, if, if we say that a, a user should be alerted when they're spending too much time, that kind of puts the the blame, kind of a blame on user. Well, you, you should control yourself better or something mm. like that. And not that these systems are designed to uh, increase that engagement that people feel. So at the same time, the whole, whole design of the system is doing everything it can to keep you on the platform. And now you're going to say, well, in addition to that, we're going to ping you once in a while and let you know that you've been on too long, even though that's yeah. what we've been trying to do. Um, so the, sure, I, I think anything that, that can help, we should try, but we should also be looking at the root causes of the problem. Mm. Uh, Elizabeth, you, you were um, nodding your, your head there. I wonder if we give you um, a chance to, to weigh in. Yeah, um, well, I, I very much agree with uh, what Kyle was saying. Um, as we know on social media, we are the product, right? Um, what, we, what we provide is uh, for the companies, for social media companies like Meta and for the Instagram platform is an opportunity for them to do two related things. One is to create a model of you and people like you and the people you know. And two is to advertise to you, which uh, Instagram is particularly effective at, um, so that they can um, make money. Mm -hmm. And so they benefit, as Kyle was saying, from the longer that you're on the platform, from the more you tell them about you by what you look at, what you like, who you talk to, who you follow, what you post. And so um, the idea of taking a break is something that sure, we know we should all, we all know we should take a break from social media. Even adults who are, who are have, you know, well-developed senses of self, um, we know that we should do that and we know how hard that is. Um, so if you think about a team like Molly, who is experiencing something probably very much on their own from what Ian's been saying, and I think that's often true for teens on their phones, 
That's not something that their, their families necessarily know really what they're doing. They're going down a, um, a rabbit hole potentially of content that reinforces itself. And so if the content is something about self-harm, they'll continue to look at content about self-harm. And there isn't a mechanism by which, you know, it's unlikely that you'll you'll be getting sort of alternative messages about mm. what else you might be looking at the way many of these systems, including Instagram, are currently designed. Yeah. Um, just on that on that point, I can see um, Emma Jackson has very politely observed Tortoise's sort of loosely held rule that we don't ask questions in a thinking. But I think this one is an important kind of idea to air out. And I wonder if Emma, you're there, whether you'd like to um, to say say it for yourself. Hi, Emma. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Ian, you said something, by the way, thank you very much for sharing your story and for always sharing your story since Molly's death, because it's very progressive, I think, if that's the right word. Um, I I was struck by something that you said in when you were explaining it about the normalising of anxiety and depression. And I wondered if you would be able to explain a little bit more about what you meant by that. Um, I recall the sort of hashtag, it's okay to not be okay. Is that the kind of thing you're talking about or is it something different? I think um, the sort of hashtag, it's okay to not to be okay um, is, is a positive thing. Um, I think we should encourage um, talk about mental ill health, about um, self-harm, about suicide, about some of the problems that, that might come, come with it because, um, there's a stigma surrounding it that doesn't allow for dialogue, doesn't encourage people to, to explore these subjects. They're taboo subjects, particularly for young people. Um, one of the things we learned from Molly's notes was she would say, how, how do you, later in her life, how do you tell the people that you love you want to die? So there in that sentence alone, to me, there was, she wanted to do something about it. It's a massive step for someone who finds themselves in that desperate place. But she couldn't find a way to tell the people who loved her and didn't want her to die that that's what she wanted to do. She knew that would be very hard for us. Of course, we so wish she had. When I was talking about normalising, I think I was more meaning an individual who, particularly a young individual, who's struggling to come to terms with what's happening to them. They don't understand um, um their state of mind maybe or why they feel the way that they do and it, i think it's very normal for young people to reach out to the internet to to find help molly was a wonderfully independent person she would solve her own problems nearly always by herself she would ask for help um but she was very uh, self-sufficient in that respect so i suspect she searched the internet for i don't know how wh am i depressed how to end depression what to do about it I also suspect once the algorithms had seen those searches, a different side of the internet latched onto her. I hope that she got some support and some help, helpful advice from the internet, which it should be very good at doing if the algorithms spin in a positive direction. But as we all know, the algorithms are very good at not always doing that. In fact, they're, they're quite good at spinning people into those rabbit holes. And I think Molly was plunged into a world which was, it was either red with graphic self-harm content, or it was black and white with quite often pencil drawn cartoon content memes uh, that said things like who would love a suicidal girl. And if you're drip fed this sort of pointless nihilistic messaging over a period of time, I think the world around you, the offline world seems to become distant and you connect because you're struggling and you associate with those sort of messages. You connect ever more strongly mm. with a sort of nihilistic messaging. And then that's where it becomes normal. And, you st and that's what helps draw you into the digital world and keeps you there and exposes you algorithmically. You're fed more and more of this content. And, and suddenly that's, that's everywhere and that's normal. And the real world isn't quite true anymore, if that makes sense. Mm. 
that is certainly helpful for me to understand. Carl, um, you've got your hand up, so it'd be great to hear from you. And I, I just wanted also uh, potentially after that to put um, the question to Elizabeth of sort of the, the, the wider online world and whether there's a, a model potentially for a more collaborative, creative sort of socio-technical system, that, the kinds of which you've studied throughout your career, that doesn't fall prey to the system that Ian's describing. But it'd be great to hear from Kyle. And then also um, Kit Sinclair in the chat um, has has a thought that I think we should hear. So um, Kyle, please go ahead. Yeah, just quickly, because I I'm, um, I'd like to hear from this too. Yeah. Uh, just that uh, I have reviewed some data from these kinds of interactions that Ian was talking about, this normalizing. And it's pretty shocking to see the, the subtle ways that individuals, and I don't know what motivates them, can encourage one another to for self-harm, towards self-harm. And um, I think if you haven't experienced that, it's it's hard to understand it, but it's it's out there. It's very, very much the case. Is it the sort of thing that you're talking about, um, comments and resharing messages, et cetera, to that that feed into that? Yeah. Right. right, right, and and in my case, I'm an arm's length because I'm looking at it from a you know AI training perspective, but being uh, an individual who's kind of involved in that discussion in that group, I, I just can't imagine it. Even for me, I couldn't I couldn't do it for too long without having to yeah. step away. Um, Elizabeth, it'd be great uh, to get your comment, and then I, I'd love to hear from from Kit and also from uh, Aquayemi for Claude. Yeah, I might follow up first on what Kyle was saying about uh, going back to something you were saying before about AI ethics and then talk more broadly about platforms. Yeah. Um, so um, so it's great when when people like Kyle are, are, are thinking about how to work from an ethical framework. And I think in the academic world, um, those those frameworks are are pretty robust and they've uh, now uh, being um, implemented in all kinds of uh, policy, which is great. And I think the next step is exactly what Kyle is talking about is to sort of bridge the, the work between the people who are implementing the systems and people who are uh, thinking about what are the structures we need to be doing to create ethical AI systems. And sometimes those are the overlapping groups, sometimes those are the same people. Um, and I would say the same for you know uh, content moderation and and other um, social media issues as well. So of course there's AI based content moderation, and then there's still human content moderation. And a lot of uh, organizations use both together. Um, and um, so it's it, it, it those concerns come up for AI and are not exclusive to AI. Um, in terms of uh, thinking about how do you build social media, or your be you know if you're an individual, get involved in social media in ways that are positive. Um, I think there's uh, you know we can we can all think of personal examples of where we had um, a positive experience online. Um, I think there's a lot of design choices that go into social media. So. For example, Instagram um, started out as very much a haven for photographers to share their work. And it is fundament fundamentally a, a visual medium, right? One of the things that people really liked about it early on and still use is, is the filtering. And over time, it's had more videos and, and other sort of richer media. Um, but, the, but the sort of quality of the image the qual uh, is still quite an emphasis. This could play out terribly for someone with body image issues. So if, if what you're trying to do is put a perfect version of yourself out um, and you're trying to, you're seeing all these excellent quality images, both in terms of the photography, the filtering, the Photoshopping, um, as well as, you know, just I'm a happy person, you know, the sort of FOMO thing. Um, that that could play out really poorly. 
Um, you can also uh, envision how f uh, it could be a very positive thing for anyone, for a teen who's interested in writing and wants to express themselves, find other writers, uh, a, a, an adult who, uh, you know, has a car obsession and they, they, they hack cars and they want to, you know, share what they're doing there. So there's, there's the sort of use issue, but I do think there's an interaction between the design of a system. Um, so a visual system as opposed to a system that Twitter is about words, gets snarkier, um, you know, uh, uh, something like Snapchat, it gets goofier because of all the, you know, you can't take yourself quite so seriously when your face is a mouse. Um, you know, it, it's a, it's each has its own sort of characteristics. That's really helpful. So um, I, I would love to hear from Aquayumi, Claude, um, if possible. And the, there's been a, a whole load of contributions in the chat, um, starting, I think, a, a ways up now with the question of um, age based moderation, age ver verification. And I've, I've written down a, a question around sort of harmful by design and how we change a, a situation that's harmful by design but um maybe we'll circle back to that it would be great to hear what what you think uh Akuyemi. you might have to unmute you hi luke awesome. and good evening hi everyone and participants oh, yeah. Yeah. um so my name's Akuyemi claude oh, i'm a campaigner oh, and from my own perspective i see that it's a very interesting one because I'm very concerned with the laws that are coming through and the fact of proof of ID for individuals who are making a social media account. And I think it's important that we do I have much compassion for the ones that have lost loved ones because of social media and because of the uh, bad messaging and also the circumstances which had happened in those circumstances so much compassion but what i am very concerned is that it is a platform for some individuals like activists as a, a way to connect with their network and the importance of free messaging and also freedom of speech because there's been certain laws that have tried to curb freedom of speech and the right of campaigning and getting the message out there within our communities about important uh, causes, important um, issues which need addressing. I mm. think what's really important as well is we need a government, I think our government needs to understand the support that our mental health services need and the importance of the NHS that is down to their knees and not really getting the investment that they are yeah. rightly deserved with and the importance of like equality within the tech world as well and representation and i just think that you know we need these platforms for freedom of speech and i think that there is a factor that we cannot have a uh, social media that becomes very institutionalized because mm. of governments wanting to have more control within social media however there's been the other bad uh, sides to it but i think we have to be very cautious of how we uh well take the next steps and yeah. also how we still make freedom of speech and still make individuals feel that they are able to deliver their messages if yeah. they want to thank you so much I mean, that's really really helpful weaving together of, of some of the threads that we we hope would sort of come come up in this conversation really really helpful contribution ian you've, you've got your hand up so it would be great to hear from you Sorry, just trying to unmute myself. Um, yes, Aquimi, I, I absolutely agree with so much that you said there. Um, and it's really important that we move forward uh, without overreacting. Um, I think if you look at tragic cases like Molly's and the slow speed of reaction that's happened since her death, there have been sadly far too many other people that have been profoundly affected. It's not just anxiety, suicide uh, and individual problems like that of course um there's misinformation there's uh, the, the capital riots in washington just over a year ago uh, uh, rwanda um uh, genocide those sort of things that can be can be happening across the world so many aspects that uh, social media um can can amplify it's really important to remember the good side of social media uh, it's it's a lifeline for so many it's been vital during lockdown um 
And I think freedom of speech is essential and it's, it's vital we don't overreact, which is why I, I welcome the, in the UK um, the report into the government's draft online safety bill that's, um, that's um, just been published because they've looked through this very detailed legislation and they've moved it forward and they've protected those, those, um, those important areas like freedom of speech so that people have a right to say um, what, they, what they want to say without fear of censorship. There's mm. one other thing I'd, I'd like to add very quickly, if I might, is as a, as, a, as a sign of a lack of active development, um, we, the Molly Rose Foundation, have um, been connected with a charity on the other side of the world in New Zealand. Um, and together, um, we, we have a service called Find a Helpline. And what this New Zealand charity have done is they have a database um, of over 1,600 helpline charities, and that's global database. And wherever you are in the world, whatever your problem is, you can, you can use their database, you can use their tool, you can go online to their website. It's also on the Molly Rose Foundation website. There's a, there's a, a widget on the website where you could put a specific problem, you could put a specific geographical location, and that, that tool will help connect you to the help and support that you need, that's your help and support, because there's a bewildering amount of help and support out there. That's, mm -hmm. to me, a good use of digital tech. That's the sort of thing that AI could point towards. I've seen people in the chat saying, why can't algorithms detect when people are looking, searching for suicidal things or anxiety or self-harm? Well, I think they can, and I think they can connect them to support. And another example of that, which is, is here and now and available, is a tool that Alice Hendy has set up, a digital tool called Ripple. Um, and she set this up within a year of the death of her brother um, to suicide. And um, this tool is a plugin that you can put into browsers. So if ever you start searching for those tools and looking for alarming content, um, this thing that's been invisible on your computer will pop up and say, we think you might need help do you want to be connected to help? And that mm. seems a really, again, a really positive use of tech. And one, no, no credit to me, it's all Alice's work, but I was very slightly involved in one meeting. And what was really quite horrifying was the inertia that existed um, at the people at that meeting, one particular tech platform that I'm not about to name, but there was a lot of inertia in adopting this when I mm. can't help but think that using tech to connect people to help and support if they need it, is a good thing. Yeah, um, I, I would love to to dwell on that a little bit, but I um, quite helpfully just received a message in Zoom from Jim Knight, who says that he was a, a member on the Joint Committee um, in Parliament that you've just referenced, Ian. So I think it would be really helpful um, if we could get him to, to hear his, uh, his thoughts. Um, and then Elizabeth, it, it would be great to come back to you. Hi, Jim. Um, hi, Luke. And sorry, I've only just been able to join, but I came in to hear Ian uh mentioned the committee and uh and i heard the comments that were made prior to him around um the the importance of anonymity which is something that as a as a committee we um took quite a lot of evidence around and and really mindful that actually a sense that the uk is perhaps one of the leaders internationally as a as a parliament, as a legislature, and trying to to do something to regulate the the downsides of social media, and that therefore others will follow the lead that we take, and that we have to be mindful not just of the importance of anonymity for people in this country, but also the importance overseas um, if if other governments choose to follow the mm. models of, of regulation that that we adopt, and we do think. It's important that there is traceability. You know, we heard you know, very strong evidence from you know, the likes of uh, you know, Rio Ferdinand from football, or from you know, Ian gave us evidence you know, from from a, a number of different victims who who want the law enforcement and others to have traceability, but at the same time they want to be able to preserve anonymity. And uh, we think that the there are ways of of uh, regulators working with the platforms around um, around them ha having to be confident that in the end they can they can trace the identity of the people who are uh, 
abusive who are causing harm to others online. Yeah. Um, we, I'm afraid we probably have to be realistic that in, in some regimes around the world that are, um, that are chasing after LGBT people or you know, uh, people who, who, who suffer uh, discrimination, um, that they probably know who you are anyway. And that there's um, because they're using spyware, they're using various various technologies. We uh, and and that there's a sort of realism about that in terms of the traceability, because obviously some of those regimes may try and force um, the uh, platforms to disclose the identities that that we would say that the platforms need to know. Mm -hmm. And and there's something to be debated there. And the final thing I'd say on on this issue, Luke, is that we're as a committee, I think we were really keen on you know, the possibility that you could have your identity verified as a user in the same way that you know, the blue tick exists on Twitter, as an example. Could there be a white tick or could there be something else? So that then, oh, apologies, we've got a, a, a noisy vote happening. So I'll, I'll, I'll finish the point, but um, the... Uh, uh, what would then be possible with that kind of verification is that you can then only have your posts or be followed or follow people who are verified. So that then would take out all of that anonymous abuse because uh, the identity isn't verified. I'll now go on mute and protect yeah. you all. Th thanks a lot, Jim. I, I would love to, if, if possible, um, maybe towards the end when the alarm has stopped to, to put the point to you about the inertia that, that Ian's identified in terms of the, the sort of length of time it's taken for change to, to seem to embed um, and what potentially you think your role is in the role of the Joint Committee in, in, in combating that. But um, Elizabeth, you, you, you had your hand up until a moment ago. I wonder if I give you, give you the chance to come in on that or, or um, some, some of the previous points. And then, and then there are a couple more people in the chat who would be great to, to get to. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Luke. Um, in response to sort of uh, both uh, Ian's introduction of the inertia and the sort of freedom of speech and legislation le legislation question, um, I think we have seen um, that uh, you know the the Wall Street Journal released this article. Uh, the Facebook did everything it could not to release the underlying study that was that slide and they didn't they just did the slide deck with some commentary uh, we had the whistleblower um, and for the U.S. Senate Francis Hagan who spoke uh, which was you know I think another series of things that happened in a very short order um, and still change is very slow um, and I think um, I think we would expect that that would continue um, so I um for, for several reasons. First of all, again, the the the, the incentive structure structure uh, structures for users versus companies are very different. Um, the, it's very hard to do research to kind of combat what um, you know academic research to sort of combat what uh, the data that Facebook themselves can work with within their sort of walled gardens of data. Yeah. Um, the uh, their motivation for doing the kinds of research they would want to do would be very different than what uh, I would imagine the kinds of research that Ian would would envision uh, that would answer some of the questions he would have about not only Molly but but other kids uh, and teens like Molly. Um, so, uh, getting at the sort of freedom of speech issue that Claude brought up uh, earlier, you know, we need to have our freedom of speech, and I, I couldn't agree with him more, really. Um, but I think right now the power, you know, in terms of who who has control right now, it's it's very much in private hands, and that to me indicates that uh, it's important for uh, to to think about the regulatory context and yeah. how it can be strengthened. Um, and to sort of Jim's point uh, earlier in the conversation. Yeah, um, I would love to if we could go to my colleague Liz, who um, put quite an interesting statement in the chat just a moment ago um, about battling with Instagram to stay positive. And I wonder if we could hear more about that, Liz. Hello. Hi. Oh, sorry. Um, I was just talking about how um, 
I don't know if this is helpful at all, but um, my Instagram, uh, I sort of come in and out of love with it, and it's a fight. <laughs> right. <laughs> clear out the rubbish and try and put the nice jolly things back in but I have to sort of work at it which is absolutely not the point I suppose mm. you're meant to sort of be passive and scroll 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 then I notice myself becoming sadder and I'm like oh perhaps I'll clear out some of these people that are winding me up or I don't know and I know it's not it's not the same as Twitter and that the algorithm can kind of funnel you into this um sort of narrow frame and I'm a grown-up and I only follow you know people who take photographs in leads you know it's not like it's super dangerous but so, but somehow there's something about the action of using it or something that means you have to sort of invest energy and focus into keeping yourself yeah. out of the mire and I think you know I'm a 45 year old woman I should know better but I, you know I, I I am very fearful of my kids they're 11 and 9 I'm very fearful of them wanting to be involved in it that they aren't yeah. at the moment but I, I'm nervous about that eventuality. Yeah. Well, well that's what I, I thought was, um, yeah, was interesting about that comment was this sort of swimming upstream issue. Um, and that made me think of what Elizabeth's just said about the cross incentives. There's one force pulling users in one direction, which is towards the content that leads to the highest levels of engagement, essentially, but also is potentially the most disturbing, the most harmful, the most extreme. And then the other direction is people wanting to have the forces, again, that you mentioned, Elizabeth, and that Akriyemi Claude mentioned, the, the positive ones, the ones that are constructive to your sense of self and, and, and ideas about community and collaboration and, and creativity. And it feels like that might be something worth uh, salvaging. Um, Roger Taylor, you, you've got your hand up. It'd be great to hear from you. And I, I'm led to believe that the bells have stopped ringing with Jim. So maybe we could go back to him to, to hear his thoughts. Uh, hi, Roger. Nice to see you. Hi. Uh, yes. Uh, and thank you for a fascinating debate. And, 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 and thank you to Ian in particular for really bringing our attention to what matters here. Um, the, the the point I just want I just wanted to raise and Liz will can talk about this I'm sure much better than I can but I just wanted to raise this issue about data intermediation and the fundamental problem we have here you know the driver of inertia the the problem we have holding people to account which is that the the power lies to a, a you know to a, such an, an overwhelming degree with the platforms who who have all the data um, and I just wanted to raise this issue of data intermediation and the power of it and the concern that uh, it doesn't feature as much in regulatory plans as I think it needs to. And I think that's partly because of uncertainty about complexity and delivery. Um, I'm, so, I'm sorry, Roger, could you just help us with what, um, with what it is? So two examples here. The first would be this issue, for example, of uh, maintaining anonym anonymity. Right trying to verify various facts. So age verification is extremely important, but you can do it as it were through a, an intermediary who will confirm as it were your age through perhaps knowing your details such as your personal details required to confirm that, um, but doesn't pass that on to the, the platform. So you can you can have a platform that knows you are definitely over 18, but doesn't know anything else and it has it on mm -hmm. a reliable source. I mean, you could, you could extend that to a being being able to verify who the person is you could have an intermediary who says yes we, we know for a fact who this person is but we're not going to tell you facebook or instagram but should it come to a legal necessity to reveal that we do have, have that information right one role of intermediation the, the other role is is in simply trying to ascertain whether platforms really are doing all they can uh to uh limit their algorithms and and, and as as i think it was ian pointed out you know, there is an element of trust here because if you're incentivized to do the wrong thing, but you promise to do the right thing, mm. <laughs> how do you know how hard you've really tried to do the right thing? Uh, yeah. It's difficult to do that without having a level of access to data, which is potentially, and, and I, I very much took the point about we don't want social media to be institutionalized, which is correct, but we do need civil society institutions that have the capabilities and the access to data to, to properly hold people to account. Yeah. So those are the issues that I think we're, 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 you know, I'd like to see those issues much front and centre in, in our plans to deal with the problems we've been talking about today. Um, but I know, I know Liz can perhaps might be better placed to, to, to talk about that further, but, but that's the, 
Great. Yeah, th thank you very much, Roger. It was really helpful. I, I, I actually wondered, um, Kyle, whether there's just a, a phrase there around sort of the, the, the ingredients that sit alongside moderation that can inform them, can help them on their way, and that the sort of overall outcome can potentially be more positive. I wondered in, in the work that you're doing, how much of this is a moderation task and how much of it is governance, his leadership is, is changing the sort of underlying um, conditions that in which that, that moderation system sits. Right, it's, yeah, as you might guess, it's all intertwined. It, 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 all of it has to feed into each other. So the content moderation, well, content moderation covers a bigger system than you might imagine just mm -hmm. by itself, but the policies that go along with it are really what's critical. And the content moderation is a tool that you use in order to uh, implement those policies. So having something that can detect the right context to provide the right support, for example, um, all, all that has to tie together. Mm -hmm. And I guess to, to take that point one step further, um, how, in, in your view, do we start to look at getting that context right? So, I mean, Roger mentioned civil, civil society groups have a note here about um, more robust frameworks and regulation and things. Um, wh what have you seen that you think are sort of necessary, if not sufficient conditions for, for getting that change in place around, around, around the moderation system, as, as you mentioned? Yeah, there's, th this is a, a huge tension in all of this, you know, between people being able to express themselves freely, um, for having very strong reasons to ma maintain anonymity in other situations where anonymity is just highly dangerous. It's, mm. there, this tension is constant and uh, regulators are, are considering the different aspects of it. I think all of us have to be aware and have to be contributing to this conversation because we have to get to a point where we can have safe online spaces with quality information. I think we're certainly not there now. Yeah, yeah. Um, Jim, Jim, if you would, um, the, the, the question about, I mean, to put it frankly, is what's taking so long. Um, but I, I wondered if you could just add a bit more color to the idea of sort of what process is the committee working through, what, what stands in the way. Um, and then I'd, I'd love to get back round to, to Ian and to Elizabeth and to, to a few other people. I'm conscious we're sort of running a bit short on time. Um, thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm just posting a link to the committee report, I hope in the chat, or, or I will do by, by the time I've, uh, this is finished. Um, we produced a report that was published in December to, to Parliament, but to the government, we're, we're awaiting their response, but the indications are that they will um, agree with quite a lot. We don't know quite how much, um, but they will make changes to the draft legislation that they had previously published in order to, um, to meet some of our concerns following the evidence that we took. Um, mm. And then the word is, no, you know, outside of government, nobody knows, but the word is that they'll probably introduce the legislation into the Commons first, probably, I would have thought before Easter, March sort of time. Um, there's a lot of political pressure on them to get on with it. Um, and then it'll take a while to get through both houses, it's a, it's quite a long, it's quite a technical piece of legislation, but the fact that it's had the pre-legislative scrutiny in the joint committee means it should, that should accelerate it. So hopefully then the law will be passed, let's say by the autumn to mm -hmm. have um, Ofcom as a proper regulator, properly resourced, um, producing codes of practice that then the platforms will then have to publish risk assessments uh, against with criminal sanctions, with fines, etc. cetera. Um, mm. That will take, I would say, um, through next year before that all properly then impacts on what's happening. Um, so I, I would guess we are you know, two years just about um, off 
really feel it, feeling the change. But, mm -hmm. you know, there has been some change already. Um, one of my colleagues here in the Lords, um, Beban Kidron, um, pushed through the data protection legislation and age um, appropriate design code, which is already starting to improve things for children in terms of the design of platforms. Right. Uh, and we're pushing the the uh, information commissioner who has jurisdiction over data protection to do more with the age verification uh, with the age appropriate design code um so we're we're constantly looking for ways to accelerate this but mm. um unfortunately and you know and we are ahead of the game in this country but unfortunately it's complex and no yeah. one's really tried to control the most litigious companies in the world in this way before yeah and yeah. Uh, and we've got to be really careful given that they've got bottomless pits to spend on lawyers mm. yeah I, I i completely agree i'm struck by the fact that it could feel like a a very long two years for for a great many number of families um so yeah th thanks very much for weighing in on that jim it's um it's great that you were able to join um just bef before we sort of try and bring it to a close, it would be really helpful, I think, to consider sort of the, the lay of the land in this argument, which I think at times can feel a bit intractable because, as Jim's just said, vast amounts of money, data, resource, access, power on the side of these companies and relatively little understanding or information and, and transparency on the on the other side about what can be done and, and, and families who are, who are left almost desperately considering what the options are um it, it would be great if i i could to just get around um our panelists one final time to to hear some final thoughts on what what they believe are the important things we need to look at as tortoise going forward um as, as a newsroom but also the parts of this conversation that um are most important to them and i want elizabeth could we start with you yeah, certainly. I mean, I, I'm encouraged that, uh, you know, work is being done by Jim and others. Uh, this sort of, you know, this kind of work is, is, is never fast, but probably it shouldn't be to be done thoughtfully. And I think the legislative work is absolutely critical here. I think um, another element that I think would be really important to change is um, ethical research practices within um, within private organizations, public research goes through review processes, private research does not. Public researchers do not have access to the same data that private companies have. That mm -hmm. is a problem that could be fixed and very different stories could be told based on people who are interested in the issues that Ian is bringing up and others are bringing up. Um, I think that um, you know, media and digital literacy is very important to be being discussed in schools and families. Um, I think, uh, you know, it's, it's often very hard to know what's going on in your teen's head. Uh, I'm a parent of a teen myself. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that um, looking for resources um, uh, that will help families have kinds of conversations earlier is very important on a family level. So I'll end with that. Thank you very much. That's really helpful. Um, Kyle, um, if you would, I, I don't know if there's parts of that that you want to build on or um, some of the ideas that you think we could we could take away from from the discussion today. Yeah, I very much agree with the uh, the idea that the legislative work is important because the companies are not going to police themselves. The, the leadership and the business model are both lining up incentives to go the opposite way. Mm. But at the same time, I'm very glad that Aqua Yemi Claude spoke up to point out the fact that um, you know there's risks around the regulation too. It's it could uh, it could drive things in a way that just uh, removes these platforms as a way for uh, individuals to express themselves in, on important things. Mm. Um, I also think Liz's point about the digital literacy is extremely important, and we have to. Uh, start getting all kinds of people better able to understand and assess the information that they're exposed to. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so, Ian, I, I we'll finish with you if we could, um, because I, I think um, Molly, Molly, Molly's story is such a um, 
compelling and um, unforgettable gateway into what's a bigger uh, sort of universe of concerns about the way that we all engage with this tech technology. But it's it's clear from everybody who's joined tonight that um, it is certainly an important part of all of our lives and, and difficult to walk away from this um, feeling optimistic, perhaps. But if you could, um, especially given the work of the Molly Rose Foundation and efforts to actually make a positive difference, could you give us some of your um, some of your thoughts and ideas from this conversation elsewhere that you'd you'd like people to take away? Yeah, despite everything that's been said this evening, I am optimistic. I'm optimistic mm. because there are things that are changing. I'm optimistic that the UK government made a promise to be for the UK, for for the UK to be the safest place in the world to be online and with the, the um, online safety bill and this the publication of this report in particular, I think it's moving well in that direction. And that's a step that's needed um, to make the online world safe. I'm reminded of a thing that Tim Berners-Lee, um, um, his organization, the Worldwide Web Foundation, has, has, uh, has launched for some years now. It's called their contract. They call it the contract for the web. And they say that um, governments need to take responsibility to make the web safer. And we're seeing that happen. They say that at the other end of the scale, individuals need to do that. And that's something that needs to change. We all need to behave like responsible digital citizens. And that means mm -hmm. not posting harmful content ourselves, but also realizing when we're being exposed to harmful content and taking steps to protect ourselves. So that's the other thing. And the, the other step in, in Berners-Lee's um, contract for the web is that the, the companies, the corporations need to act as well. And they're the ones that are lagging behind. But I think that public interest in this is growing. It's growing uh, in, in the UK, it's growing in Europe and around the world, particularly at the moment in the US as well. There's a lot of people right. who are particularly interested in this. So um, I would say that if we move fast and mend things, to, to paraphrase the famous fates mm. book quote, and by moving fast, I, I mean doing it sensibly in a, a, a pace that will allow it to happen um, uh, in a controlled way, then there is hope for the future. Move fast and mend things. Um, yeah, that's something we should certainly um, s stick with, I think, as a newsroom and, and all of us going away to think about this. I, I've been um, struck by a lot of the sort of constructive recommendations and and the idea that we, we can, can be optimistic, I suppose, about the way that detailed legislation is emerging and i think there, there's a um there's a really interesting line to to follow on using ai to detect people who are vulnerable and offer support um looking at their usage profiles and the content they've been seeing um but it's it's hard to get past the the recognition i think that we all had of of how um opposed the incentives are between users and comp and the, the major companies at the moment and that's something to consider further um at, at Guillemi's point um I think resonated with a lot of us and is a, an extremely important one for understanding the tension in this debate and, and avoiding uh, a kind of an hour-long bashing of Instagram as, as something that we we ought to do away with um so uh, yeah it's just left to me to to say thank you to everybody who's joined in to Emma to Kit um to to my colleagues um to Ben Cropper who's been very active and had some thoughtful um questions and and contributions about what the role of journalism is in this debate so um we'll go away and and think about it carefully um and thank you very much also to to the panelists for joining to ian to kyle to elizabeth um and i hope you all have a great evening thank you